Chymotrypsin is a serine protease, and it has the ability to catalyze the cleavage of peptide bonds on the carboxyl end of large hydrophobic nonpolar amino acids. For instance, chymotrypsin cleaves at the carboxyl end of methionine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, as well as tryptophan. Now, as we discussed previously, it's the presence of the catalytic triad inside the active side of chymotrypsin that actually gives it the power of catalysis, gives it the ability to actually cleave those peptide bonds. So remember, the catalytic triad is basically this collection of three individual residues, aspartate, histidine, and serine, which work together to basically promote the cleavage of those peptide bonds. Now, the question still remains, what exactly gives chymotrypsin its specificity? What gives chymotrypsin the ability to only cleave on the carboxyl end of specific amino acids, those amino acids that contain bulky hydrophobic side chain groups? Now, to answer this question, we actually have to study the shape of the active side, the structure of that enzyme. If we examine the active site of that enzyme, we're going to find something called the S1 pocket. And the S1 pocket in chymotrypsin is basically that region to which that side chain group will actually move into. And if we examine the shape and structure of the S1 pocket, we're going to find that it's relatively long, so relatively deep, and mostly hydrophobic, so nonpolar. And because of that structure of the S1 pocket, only those amino acids that contain side chain groups that are long, nonpolar, do not have any charges, will actually be able to fit into that pocket, into the active site, without creating too much electric repulsion. So, amino acids such as methionine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So, once again, it's the catalytic triad in the active site, it's the presence of these three individual amino acids that give chymotrypsin its catalytic power, the ability to actually catalyze the cleavage of those peptide bonds. But it's this long and narrow shape. And the fact that it's mostly hydrophobic, it's the shape of the S1 pocket that actually gives chymotrypsin its specific nature, its specificity to cleave only on the carboxyl end of specific side chain groups. Now, as we discussed in our uh, study of proteases, we basically said there are many different types of proteases that exist inside our body and inside nature. Now, so far we focused on serine proteases and we use chymotrypsin as the prototypical serine protease. But of course, in our body, in our digestive system, for example, we have many other examples of serine proteases. The question is, what is the mechanism that these other serum proteases actually use to cleave peptide bonds? Well, it turns out other serum proteases also use this same catalytic triad. And what that means is they also carry out the catalysis process by using the same exact mechanism, namely covalent catalysis and acid-based catalysis. And two examples of other serum proteases inside our digestive digestive system that also contain the same catalytic triad is trypsin as well as elastase. So chymotrypsin is not the only serine protease that utilizes this catalytic triad. In fact, trypsin and elastase are two other serine proteases found in our digestive system that use this same exact catalytic triad and therefore the same exact mechanism of catalysis that we spoke about in the previous lecture. Now, the question is, why do we have different types of serum proteases inside our body? And the question is, what exactly differentiates trypsin, elastase, and chymotrypsin if they have the same exact catalytic triad? Well, remember, it's the catalytic triad that gives the enzyme its catalytic power, that gives the protease the ability to cleave those peptide bonds. 
but it's the shape of that active side, the S1 pocket, that determines the specificity of that protease, the type of peptide bond it actually breaks. And so the difference between chymotrypsin and trypsin and elastase is not in the type of catalytic triad used, but it's in the shape of that particular S1 pocket, the structure of that S1 pocket, as we'll see in just a moment. As a result of a slight variation in the S1 pocket of trypsin and elastase, we see that these other serum proteases cleave other amino acids. So, Although trypsin elastase use the same mechanism, so covalent catalysis and acid-base catalysis, which we spoke about in the previous lecture, they differ in their specificity, and that has to do with, uh, and that has to do to the fact that there is a slight structural difference in the S1 pocket in trypsin as well as elastase. And let's see what these differences are and what they result in. So let's begin with trypsin. So trypsin catalyzes the cleavage of peptide bonds on the carboxyl end of lysine and arginine. And if you recall, lysine and arginine both contain positive charges on their side chain groups. Now the question is, why is this true? So trypsin uses the same exact catalytic triad that chymotrypsin uses, but what gives this trypsin the difference in specificity? Well, if we examine the S1 pocket of trypsin, at the bottom of that S1 pocket, we're going to see we're going to see a residue that we don't see in the S1 pocket of chymotrypsin. At the bottom of the trypsin S1 pocket, we have a negatively charged side chain that came from the aspartate that we see in trypsin and we don't see in chymotrypsin. So, as a result of the negatively charged side chain of aspartate 1 that is found at the bottom of the S1 trypsin pocket, we see that this trypsin only cleaves at the carboxyl end of those amino acids which are long and contain a positive charge at the end. And these happen to be lysine and arginine. So if we examine the following hypothetical polypeptide, we have glycine, this one here, we have lysine, this one here, we have glycine, this one, we have arginine, this one, and we have glycine, this one. Now, the only ones that contain positive charges are these two amino acids. And only these amino acids will be able to actually fit into the pocket of trypsin and at the end will be able to actually interact in a stabilizing manner. So the positive charges of these two side chain groups will interact with the negative charges of the of this aspartate 189 and that and that will create a stabilizing effect it will neutralize the net charge in that space and that will create a very stable effect so at the bottom of the active side of trypsin is an aspartate residue and the negative charge of the aspartate side chain group will stabilize those amino acids that contain side chain groups with positive charges, namely the lysine and the arginine. And so the only bonds that trypsin will be able to cleave are this bond and this bond here. So at the carboxyl end of lysine and arginine. So we see that a very tiny variation in the structure of the S1 pocket in trypsin gives trypsin uh, a different specificity than that of chymotrypsin. And finally, let's move on to elastase. So if we examine the S1 pocket of elastase, we'll see the presence of two additional valine. And valine, if you recall, are these small, or valine molecules have these small, relatively small, hydrophobic chains. And notice where these two valines are positioned. They're positioned opposite of each other, and they essentially play the role of blocking the majority of the bottom portion of that S1 pocket. And so what that means is, when the side chain group of the amino acid moves into the S1 pocket, it cannot actually occupy this space here because this blocks 
as a result of the stair hindrance of the hydrophobic properties of these side chain groups. And so only those amino acids that have relatively small side chain groups and which are nonpolar, so uncharged, will be able to fit into this pocket. And so we see that elastase cleaves peptide bonds on the carboxyl end of small hydrophobic amino acids such as glycine, valine, alanine, uh, valine, alanine, leucine, and isoleucine as well as serine. So if we have this hypothetical polypeptide chain, we have glycine, lysine, alanine, phenylalanine, glycine. So the only ones which have a small hydrophobic side chain are glycine, alanine, as well as glycine at the end. So the only two peptide bonds that are going to be cleaved are this peptide bond, so on the carboxyl end of glycine, as well as this one on the carboxyl end of alanine. So lysine and phenylalanine are not small ones. This one has a large, long one and it's positively charged. Although this one is uh, nonpolar hydrophobic, it's too large to actually fit into this pocket because these two valines block the majority of that pocket. And even though this is a glycine, there's no bond on the carboxyl side and so nothing will be cleaved on this side by elastase. And so we see that two valine residues found in the S1 pocket of elastase block off the majority of the pocket in elastase and this allows elastase to only cleave small hydrophobic residues. And so we see that the majority of the serum protease is found inside our body, for instance, chymotrypsin, trypsin, as well as elastase, although they use the same catalytic triad to basically catalyze the cleavage of the peptide bonds, they actually differ in the types of amino acids that they cleave, types of peptide bonds that they cleave as a result of these structural differences and shapes in the S1 pockets of their active sites.